This is an extra video in the series about a scientific work for seminars and thesis. And this is about a very modern topic. It is about ChatGPT. ChatGPT does not really have something to do with uh, literature research, but I think it falls kind of in the same category because it can be a source of information. Or can it not? That's what we are trying to find out. Um, so the question would be, can ChatGPT and others, I always use the term ChatGPT for all those uh, services now, like AI-based uh, services which can write text for you, um, can they be uh, an, a scientific source? Can they be literature? Can they be something you can build your scientific work on? And the answer is very clearly no. Uh, an AI system like ChatGPT does not the fulfill the requirements we have uh, for scientific research, for scientific knowledge. Uh, ChatGPT is not an expert in any subject. So it's not an expert opinion, not an expert text, not expert material uh, we get. When we ask ChatGPT something, we get an answer which is quite probably quite right, but we don't know that and we cannot know that. So um, it's not an expert, the, the statements, they cannot be checked. It's very difficult to check uh, the statements which ChatGPT makes and they cannot be scrutinized. I cannot ask ChatGPT uh, where the answers come from. I can ask it, but I, can, I cannot trust the answer to the question then. So that wouldn't help me uh, in any way. Uh, and, of course, what it says is not the, resul uh, the result of scientific argumentation, but it is the result of a language model. So it is the most likely thing to say, if you, uh, if you would. Uh, if you think about how uh, uh, things like ChatGPT work, um, you give them a question you, or you uh, start with the text and then they try to determine what the most probable next word would be. And uh, that's how ChatGPT works. So it often produces good results, of course, but it sometimes produces awful results. And it's very difficult uh, to tell that. So can you use it at all uh, in your scientific work? Sure you can. You can use it as an inspiration. You can ask it question and be inspired by the answers. I think in the long run, you can even expect the answers to be mostly right, like you can expect the answers or the material, the information in Wikipedia to be mostly right. Anyway, you cannot rely on it. So when you use Wikipedia content or you want to use the, the knowledge you find in Wikipedia in your own uh, scientific work, uh, you need to to find proofs elsewhere. You need to look into other resources and prove what you say, even though you might have it from Wikipedia or might have gotten it from Wikipedia uh, to begin with. And that's uh, kind of the same here. I just want to show you a few um, quirks, a few uh, strange things in ChatGPT. Uh, which uh, I hope show you uh, that you cannot trust it just um, as it is. There is a lot in the media. There has been something in the German media where ChatGPT claimed uh, that uh, uh, elephants would be the biggest animal laying eggs. Yeah, well, of course, uh, the problem there is we don't know what has been put into the, the ChatGPT uh, uh, prompt. So ChatGPT, of course, uh, can be tricked into saying things because it takes everything you say into account and uh, just the answer uh, doesn't prove anything. Uh, but I will show you a few examples uh, which have problems uh, too and I will tell you what I entered. In most of those here, or both of those, uh, um, I just uh, started the conversation so there was nothing there before. And I started by asking uh, a question uh, or giving him uh, a hint to tell me something. What you see here in the bottom right is the town hall of Reda Wiedenbrück. That's the, um, the town I was uh, born and raised in. 
And you see, it's a marvel of 1970s brutalism, something we know very well here at Paderborn University too. So, very modern building. Uh, some people like it, some people don't. That's another question. I asked ChatGPT to tell me about it, uh, both in English and in German. And uh, let's have a look at the English uh, one first. It's uh, there at the top. And it tells me the town hall of Riedewinbrück is a historic building located in the center of the town of Riedewinbrück in the North Rhine-Westphalia region of Germany. That's wrong already because Reda and Wiedenbrück were joined together and uh, Re uh, the, the town hall is in the center of Reda. It's not in the center of Reda Wiedenbrück. There's nothing in the center of Reda Wiedenbrück. The building was constructed in the 16th century and has served as the town hall since that time. <laughs> features a distinctive architecture with a Renaissance-style facade uh -huh, and a clock tower. Okay, where's the clock tower that's 40 meters tall? And so on and so on. Uh, so that's definitely nonsense. Um, let's look at what it says here down in the German version. Uh, it says it has a three-story building, which is not true either. It's way larger. Uh, and it had been built in the years 1897 to 1899. And it's still the place where the administration uh, is meeting. It's not true either. It tells you two different things in German and in English. Um, it's uh, both not true. It's both completely nonsense. But how would you know? You only know when you know. Because, of course, the, the text itself makes sense. It's not that uh, it's uh, gibberish or something like that. You can understand the text. Another example from the field of computers and from the field of uh, computer history. And I give you that because that's something I know a lot of. Uh, so I know when it is wrong and I know when it is right. And uh, I'll give you an interesting example here. Uh, what you see up there is a, a device which is called Rollkugelsteuerung. Uh, a trackball control or whatever you want to, rolling bowl control. This has been uh, invented in the 1960s and the late 60s uh, at the, the German company called Telefunken and it could be uh, interpreted as a predecessor to the mouse. It works exactly like a mouse. You, you move it on the table and then something on a screen moves around. Um, and it has a button at the top. It's quite a big device. This device has been has fallen into obscurity. Nobody knew about it anymore, except a few people who did it at Telefunken. And uh, it was not well known in computer history. So computer history typically uh, traces back the origins. Um, computer history typically traces back the origins of the computer mouse to Douglas Engelbart, who invented a, a device which then became the computer mouse around at the same time at the Stanford Research Institute in the United States of America. He didn't know about the German invention. They don't, didn't know each other. And uh, well, while the German uh, invention fell into obscurity, uh, Engelbart's uh, invention uh, got improved and improved and uh, really became the computer mouse we still have uh, today, which one, uh, one of which I have here. Okay, so that is the fact. Uh, that's what uh, computer history know, uh, knows about it. So now I asked uh, uh, ChatGPT about it and I asked it in German, tell me something about the German invention of the computer mouse. And what it told me now is really, uh, really interesting. I'm uh, translating that now for you. Uh, um, the invention of the computer mouse can be traced back to the German uh, engineer Douglas Engelbart. Uh, he created with his team in the 1960s at the Stanford Research Institute in California, etc. Everything is correct after that, but Douglas Engelbart, of course, was not a German engineer. It was an American engineer. Uh, I asked the same question or similar one. Uh, in English, I heard there was a parallel development of the computer mouse in Germany. And here you see there was discussion before. I asked it about the invention of the mouse and it told me it's an American invention done by Douglas Engelbart uh, in uh, the United States in the late 1960s. And now what does it tell me? One of Germany's devices has been cited as a precursor to the computer mouse was developed by a team at the Telefunken company in the 1960s. The device, called Rollkugel, was a spherical trackball that could be rotated with the fingers to move the mouse, the cursor, on a computer screen. 
that's half true. That's a precursor to this one, uh, which worked the other way around, and the, the ball was at the top, and you could move that around. The Rollkugel was used in German computer systems in the 1960s and 70s. Not really true. It was not really much used. It was also used in some early Apple computers in the 1980s. That's definitely not true. There were uh, computers, Apple computers in the 1980s, which used a trackball. That's true, but it has nothing to do with that one. Uh, so there's a connection has been made which is not really true. Uh, so, um, doubtful already. But then it gets really strange. Now it says another early mouse-like device developed in Germany was the graphic tablet or graphic tablet, which was invented by German engineer Eberhard Beckmann in the early 1950s. The graphic tablet used the stylus to draw on a tablet and the movements of the stylus were translated into cursor movements on a computer screen. While the graphic tablet was not exactly the same as a computer mouse, it did involve similar concepts of using physical movement to control the, the cursor on a screen. And that's all nonsense. A graphic tablet using a stylus to move a cursor on a screen in the 1950s? That did not exist. That has not happened. Eberhard Beckmann did exist, but he had not invented a graphic tablet. So, it all sounds really sound. It all sounds really good. But how would you know? How would you know that uh, everything here is quite questionable and, to be more frank, plainly wrong? That has been an older version of ChatGPT, the 3.5 version, which is still around, still the standard version. But now there is version 4 of ChatGPT and it improved a lot. Uh, in, and you can expect that with every version, uh, ChatGPT will become better. But I asked it uh, the same uh, question or a similar question, uh, so to speak. Started the conversation anew and asked it what influence did Telefunken's Rollkugelsteuerung have on the development of graphical user interfaces. And now it tells me something about Rollkugelsteuerung itself. Okay, that might be uh, might be okay. And then it says the influence of the Rollkugelsteuerung on the development of GUIs can be seen in several ways. And then it says, intuitive interaction, the rolling ball mechanism, allowed for direct intuitive control over graphical elements, making it easier for computers to interact with and manipulate objects on the screen. The improvement in ease of use led to more widespread adoption of graphical interfaces, as opposed to text-based interfaces, which require users to memorize and enter specific commands. That's about 10 years too early. There was no graphical user interface. And the Rollkugelsteuerung did not was not used for that. It was used as an input and maybe as a graphical input in terms of coordinates, but there were no icons or menus or something like that, which you might expect uh, when you read uh, when you read that. It goes on with that, so the rest of that is also uh, questionable with the point and click paradigm. And then it says something here which is really interesting um, uh, and which puzzled me when I read it. It says. Development of the computer mouse. The Rollkugelsteuerung directly inspired the invention of the computer mouse. I think, aha, that's very interesting. So the Americans were inspired by the German computer mouse. Uh, in 1963, American engineer Douglas Engelbart independently invented a similar input device called the XY position indicator for a display system, later known as the computer mouse. Mm -hmm. That's true, he did that, and he did it independently. Engelbart was aware of the Rollkugelsteuerung and acknowledged its influence on his own invention. That's interesting. That's a contradiction in itself, first of all. Uh, either it has been independent or he was aware of it and there was an influence. That cannot be true at the same time. Well, but it gives the indication that Engelbart somehow got influenced by the German invention of this uh, Rollkugelsteuerung. And it says the computer mouse has since become the most common input device for GUIs, further popularizing the point-and-click interaction paradigm. Okay, so uh, Douglas Engelbart was influenced by Malebrein, that's the one who, uh, who created this one, says, says so in the top, and it's true that's, uh, that it says so. Um, 
I never heard about that. Uh, and uh, I think I would have because uh, I'm kind of an expert in the field. Uh, I looked into it quite a lot and there is quite a lot about the history of the computer mouse. And I think I would have somehow realized uh, that uh, uh, Douglas Engelbart was influenced by the German invention. I always thought he never knew. So I asked ChatGPT about it. And I said, did Douglas Engelbart know about Malebrand's Kohlkugelsteuerung? And now it says, and that's outrageous, I must say. It says, I apologize for the confusion in my previous response. That's okay. It always does that. When you tell it something is wrong, it apologizes for it. And then it says, upon further research... It seems that das Engelbart was not aware of Malebrand's Rollkugelsteuerung when he invented the computer mouse in 1963. Engelbart's invention, Malebrand's Rollkugelsteuerung, were developed independently and coincidentally shared similarities in their design and function. So, it says it was all wrong, I said. But what I consider outrageous is the phrase, upon further research. Who did further research here? Where? Why? When? That's nonsense. It's, it's, it's just a phrase. It's, it's just words. No one has done research here. Um, this is misleading. The first text here on the left is typically something, if I w put that out and gave it to someone, please write a, um, a text about uh, the computer mouse, one might come up with this here and include a lot of nonsense. A lot of this is true. Other things are wrong. And only if you know they are wrong, you'll realize that they are wrong. That's awful. And then it tells you it does research. So this kind of ChatGPT, for that purpose, um, I would be very, very, very skeptical. I think it will improve. And uh, over time, things will, t uh, in, in, will have a tendency to get better. But you can never know. You have no means of finding out. There are no references in here. And if you ask ChatGPT for references, by the way, it comes up with references that do not exist. It completely makes them up. Sometimes there is one in there which does exist, but often enough uh, it is not existing, non-existing references. But they sound like good references. So this is a problem. Um, that this behavior here is a problem. And people who do ChatGPT uh, know that, so it states that. But uh, nevertheless, um, it's quite likely that someone takes the, these things as facts because they are stated as facts and nobody can know that they aren't facts. There is, by the way, some method of, of figuring out whether something is a fact. Um, in ChatGPT, um, but that's of course not scientific at all, but uh, it's interesting to, to play with it. Um, uh, if something is doubtful, try to ask the same question again, not in the same thread, but create a new one and ask the same thing again. If it tells you something completely different, it's most likely that it's all just made up. So it's just a creation uh, by the system at that moment, um, which all the true things are too. <laughs> That's why it's so strange, so so difficult to grasp what's actually going on here. So that's that. Uh, that's uh, the uh, that's the one uh, aspect. And another one is if you ask it for something and it gives you an argumentation for something, ask it for the complete opposite too and see whether that's equally sound sounding. <laughs> and if that's the case, you should be very much in doubt too. And let me tell you about another phenomenon. And this is a phenomenon which I uh, joked about with colleagues of mine. Um, that, um, and that's the fact that uh, sometimes ChatGPT behaves like a student in an oral examination, but that student uh, had not prepared too much and now tries to draw from the conversation itself. Uh, and that's, of course, how it works. That's the, the behind the, the system. Um, 
I asked it something here. Um, I had a discussion before. I, I spoke with ChatGPT about part of my uh, research work, and that is uh, centers uh, in part around uh, properties of digital media. So I spoke with it about uh, digital media. And now I wanted to connect this idea with with something else, with an uh, idea with is not digital media itself, but an, a certain approach, and I wanted to make the connection. And I said, uh, that's interesting, uh, you can, uh, can you also tell me something about the concept of fundamental ideas, fundamental ideas, by Andreas Schwill? And then it uh, tells me that he's a German communication scholar who developed the concept of fundamental ideas to describe core principles underlying media systems and communication technologies. Uh, according to Schwill, these fundamental ideas are implicit assumptions or premises that are deeply embedded in our media systems and technologies and guide their development, use and impact. And then it goes on and tells me a few of those fundamental ideas. Or it's, it tells me those are the three fundamental ideas. Sounds good. Sounds plausible. I was speaking about uh, media properties and uh, funda its fundamental ideas down there. Uh, whether efficiency, accessibility and participation are fundamental ideas of media. Well, depending how you perceive the, the topic, that's not what's about here. But it's nonsense, it's plainly wrong. Andreas Schwill is not a scholar uh, uh, in communication. He is a professor for computer science education research and he did work on fundamental ideas of computer science for the classroom. So he wanted to identify those parts of computer science which are so fundamental they are not so likely to change and says when we teach them we teach people something we teach pupils something which they will very likely need later instead of teaching them the current state of the art technology which in a few years time will be obsolete so that's his approach it has nothing to do with uh, media and has nothing to do with this efficiency, accessibility and participation. So it just made it up. And of course, indeed, students sometimes do that. When you are in the, in the situation where you have to uh, react on something and you don't really know, but you can try to put things together from what you have speak been speaking about before and what is now ma mentioned now, you can come up with uh, answers with sound good, but they can be completely wrong. And here they are. It's completely uh, nonsense what it came up with. So, uh, this associativeness is a problem. Uh, and that's why it's so important to know what you have speaking about before, because you influence the system. Just having an answer without knowing what has been talked about before uh, doesn't uh, help you to understand the answer. So, uh, I hope I made clear that you cannot really use it uh, as a source of facts uh, in scientific work. Not at the moment. And I would say the way it works, you can never do that uh, because you can never know uh, what, uh, whether it's true or not. It is quite likely that becomes better and better and better and that, you, that it reaches a point where you can trust it as much as you can trust Wikipedia, which is quite a lot, but not enough for scientific work. So you can then uh, look at it and say, aha, it says this and it's most likely true. And now I have to find evidence for that. Uh, and if that's possible, if you do that, uh, there's nothing to say uh, against it. But it's not there yet. But you could still use it uh, or use it yet. You can uh, ask it for inspiration. If you uh, ask ChatGPT, about uh, inspiration for something. I did that here. Do you have ideas for seminar topics regarding the history of programming? Lanf just uh, did a typo there, which it just ignored, no problem. And it answered uh, with a list of, uh, of topics I could use in a seminar on uh, programming languages. And the list is not so bad. I could use just this. Uh, 
I have done such seminars. I have not done exactly those topics, but what makes sense uh, to do it that way? Um, oh, why not? You can, of course, do that. What happens if you just use that? Either this or something from the factual part of it. Can you just use that? Uh, it is not plagiarism. It cannot be plagiarism because it has not been created by any human being. So nobody has the rights on it. But at the moment, the discussion goes into the direction that it is still an attempted fraud, a deception, because you used an aid which you do not claim. Um, personally, I must say, I consider this uh, argumentation a little strange um, because um, when, for example, you did, uh, you looked and uh, looked something up in Wikipedia before you you were doing some research, and you looked it up in Wikipedia, and Wikipedia gave you an idea. It pointed you towards a direction which you did not have before, and then you um, look those things up and come up with a sound uh, literature and everything. Nobody said it was a deception that you didn't mention Wikipedia, even though Wikipedia gave you the idea. Nobody would have told you to do that. Now the discussion goes exactly into that direction for ChatGPT. There is uh, um, something out there from the federal government which uh, encourages schools to work exactly that way, that uh, they teach their students to include um, references, that they, that they include a reference to ChatGPT and tell uh, that they have used ChatGPT and that they should even include the prompts. I'm not sure whether that will stick. Uh, it's very new. It's a matter of discussion. But anyway, uh, let's draw something from that and let just, let's just think about acknowledgements in general. Why not acknowledge that we have gotten an idea from somewhere and we can extend that not only for ChatGPT, but we can make an acknowledgement in general, either in a footnote, just where we had it, just where it belongs, or uh, in a, uh, at the front of uh, your work or at the end of your work, you could make acknowledgements and just tell people where you got ideas from. That is sometimes done in scientific papers where uh, acknowledgements are made either to other professors, which you had good discussions with, or there is an acknowledgement uh, to one of the reviewers who get, gave you very constructive review, so you could improve your text. Uh, these kinds of acknowledgements are sometimes made. So why not acknowledge uh, if someone inspired you, friends inspired you to do something, if uh, ChatGPT created uh, the idea for something, if you used an AI system for a translation, which is now often done, it's not only ChatGPT, but the DeepL or Google Translate, you can use those things for translation. And if you use them for automatic translation, why not point, put that somewhere that parts of the text have been translated automatically with uh, a Google a Translate or whatever you use. Uh, if you ask someone for a translation, why not mention that person? Uh, so um, someone helped me, someone who studied English, uh, a friend of mine, name him uh, or her, and that, um, ask, uh, helped you with the uh, uh, translation. And if you've been made aware of something, why not mention that? Doesn't hurt and it surely would could help you uh, avoid discussions about the usage of these systems. So that would be my take on the usage of ChatGPT and similar systems. It's a little early and in the current state they're not really reliable and they will not never be 100% reliable, but you can use them already for certain things. You cannot use them for other things. Uh, please, please don't fall into the trap of using ChatGPT too often, not in uh, scientific work, neither in the solution of exercises that are provided to you, or in any kind of question that is put to you which might have very different connotations, like when I asked uh, the participants or the would-be participants of a seminar how they would tackle a certain problem and I wanted to know whether it's the right seminar for them when I then got lo uh, loads of uh, answers by ChatGPT which don't help me to make any 
a statement on that. So use it sensibly, please. So that would be this video. And in the next video, I will tell you about the presentation of your scientific work.